The very existence of the uh, Anglican Church in North America, of which the Anglican Network is a diocese, comes as a direct result of the call of the first global Anglican Future Conference in Jerusalem. And uh, so we are so grateful that we are in fact some of the fruit of this amazing movement. Which is to say this is a, a really big night for us. And I'm so glad that so many, many have traveled long distances in order to be here uh, and we're delighted. Wherever you come from, wherever you represent, we're really glad you're here. Um, I wanted to, to uh, read uh, some uh, four verses of scripture. The uh, GAFCON, it says, uh, is guarding and proclaiming the unchanging truth in a changing world. This comes directly out of the Jerusalem Declaration. And it, the scriptures are clear that we have a twofold responsibility. One is to proclaim the gospel and it is to guard the gospel and contend for the gospel. And it is worthy to be contended for. Jude writes, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and now Lord Jesus Christ. The faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. It's an interesting uh, uh, phrase which are there and I just wanted to highlight a few of delivered. The gospel is not something that was thought up by the best minds of Christian thinking but is the revealed message of the good news of Jesus Christ. It's delivered to us and that's been the, the plan. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the fact that what we received, we delivered to you, the good news of a risen Lord. Once, this good news is complete and it has content. You can get it right or you can get it wrong. Anything other than the gospel as revealed in the scriptures is no gospel at all. For all. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. People everywhere are called to deal with this faith, this message of Jesus. So it is that the common faith and salvation which is referred to in Jude is one which is at stake even although there's the security of knowing that we're kept for Jesus Christ and the great blessing at the end now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. In the midst of that security, the people of God are called to contend for the faith that has been delivered once for all the saints. So we're grateful that in the midst of the unraveling in a way of Anglicanism worldwide, God raised up this movement which began in a conference in Jerusalem in 2008. And two of the key figures for this conference are here with us tonight and we're just absolutely delighted. And I, but I wanted to say before I even introduce them that this evening is to give you a sense of what God's doing around the world through this movement, 
to prepare for a significant conference coming up again in Jerusalem. But it is also to invite you to consider giving to this movement. And in fact, this is very important for it to go forward. I want to say as the Dawson for the Anakin Network in Canada, I heartily encourage us to seriously consider this. I also want to say that in fact, we don't have a mechanism uh, now for if you give to, this, uh, to the GAFCON for you to get a receipt which will help you in your income tax. But I just want to encourage you not let that uh, distract you or discourage you from giving. And I, for one, me and my house, we're planning on giving because this is of great importance. And we are the recipients of what God has already done and believe there's much more to do. I want to uh, say that uh, I am thrilled that Archbishop Peter Akinola is here and Archbishop Peter Jensen. These are the two key figures right from the beginning of the movement. And incidentally, I heard, I had a text from Archbishop Foley Beach, our primate for the Anakin Church in North America, who on his way back from overseas wanted me to make sure I extended a hearty greeting to these honored godly men of our uh, communion and of GAFCON. Uh, and also Bishop Don Harvey, who was part of that or original group, uh, is in Newfoundland, and uh, he wished he could be here as well. So I just wanted to mention them. But, but Archbishop Akinola was uh, chairman of the committee. I mean, he was chairman of the Global South, chairman for Africa, he, primate of all Nigeria, uh, all these key, key things. But it was under his leadership that there was the call for this conference in Jerusalem, out of which has become this Global Anglican Future Conference Fellowship of Confessing Anglicans. We are deeply honored, sir, that you are present with us, and we're so grateful that you are here to, to, uh, for this. And Archbishop Peter Jensen, uh, the General Secretary and the one who was charged with the uh, leading in terms of, of the first conference and continues in this task, in preparation for the next one as well. Archbishop Jensen, we're so grateful you too are here. So we have two Archbishop Peters in our midst. We're absolutely thrilled. We honor you, we praise God for you, and we thank you for being here tonight. Would you come? Thank you so much for the warmth of the welcome, and uh, can I say immediately uh, that as far as I'm concerned, coming to Canada is always a pleasure and delight. I'm just so sorry we can't move you closer to where the Australians are, uh, and we could play cricket or do something like that together, uh, but uh, Canada and Australia have so much in common uh, that uh, it's just a shame that we don't see more of each other, one way or another. Anyhow, thank you for the warmth of the welcome. Thank you for uh, your attendance tonight. And uh, I'm very grateful indeed for the Bishop's uh, remarks. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, he has, of course, exaggerated my role, but uh, uh, Archbishop, in having Archbishop Akiola here, we have indeed the man who can justly be called the father of this movement. Uh, he is, uh, and I'm going to embarrass him, but he is a prince amongst God's people one of the most significant Christian leaders I've ever met. And uh, it is a delight to have him here. And uh, we'll be here. I'm going to interview him in a little while and you'll, you'll hear from him then. Well, it began, well, where did it begin? It began in a hotel room in Nairobi, to tell you the truth, room 1216, if I remember correctly, uh, with a whole group of us and Bishop Don Harvey was there and Archbishop Akiola was in the chair and I was there under the bed or something. Uh, <laughs> But the, uh, it began there, and um, it, it, within six months, we were meeting in Jerusalem. It was the year of the Lambeth Conference, but we could not go to the Lambeth Conference because the Archbishop of the day had invited, the Archbishop of Canterbury had invited people there who had, in our view, betrayed the faith uh, and, were, and were endorsing that which was sin. And so how could we gather? How could we share communion? And so rather than going to Lambeth, 
uh, we decided to meet in Jerusalem. And about 1,100 of us uh, from all around the place met in Jerusalem. And to, to our utter astonishment, well, the Lord was there. I shouldn't be astonished at that. Um, I came, I did a bit of organising for this, and uh, I came with the, uh, with the communique already written, of course, as you do, to make sure that they get it right. Uh, and uh, this man here <laughs> said, if you've come with the communique already written, rip it up, we're not going to do it that way. I thought he was mad. Um, <laughs> but what he did, what we did, was simply we worked together for the week and produced the Jerusalem Declaration, the Jerusalem Statement and Declaration. And it was, um, it was a God moment when it was read to us by Archbishop uh, Arombi of Uganda. Just, just watch this. There are now three people working on this. <laughs> it is our hope that this statement on the global Anglican future will be received with comfort and joy by many Anglicans around the world who have been distressed about the direction of the communion. We believe the Anglican communion should and will be reformed around the biblical gospel and mandate to go into all the world and present Christ to the nations. From Jerusalem, Feast of St. Peter's and St. Paul, 29th June 2008, the year of our Lord. Uh, you can go to the gafcon.org website and see the whole thing. If you've never seen it, please do. It was amazing. Uh, you will see uh, the heart of that Jerusalem statement on the back of this rather larger brochure, which I hope you'll take home with you. And uh, you'll see the 14 points there, which is really the heart of the statement, though the whole statement is important. And you'll see it's a restatement of the Christian faith that we believe as Anglicans, but as Christians. Uh, and if you cast your eye down there, you'll see that we believe, we rejoice in the gospel, and it's a little statement of the gospel. We believe in the Holy Scriptures, obviously central. We hold the four ecumenical councils and the creeds. Number four, we uphold the 39 articles. Uh, we gladly proclaim and submit to the unique and lordship of Jesus Christ as number five. We rejoice in the Ang Anglican sacramental heritage. Recognize that God has called and gifted bishops, priests, and deacons, number seven. We acknowledge God's creation of humankind as male and female, and the unchangeable standard of Christian marriage between one man and one woman as the proper place for sexual intimacy and the basis of the family. And number nine, we, greatly, we gladly accept the Great Commission. We're mindful of our responsibilities to be good stewards of God's creation and looking after the poor and needy. We are committed to the unity of all those who know and love Christ and the building of authentic or ecumenical relationships. Uh, we recognise the orders and jurisdictions of those Anglicans who uphold the orthodox faith and practice, and we encourage them to join us. Twelve, we celebrate the God-given diversity amongst us. Thirteen, we reject the authority of those churches and leaders who have denied the orthodox faith in word and deed. This was an Anglican statement. We reject the authority. We pray for them and call upon them to repent and to return to the Lord. We rejoice at the prospect of Jesus coming again. Now, I've gone right through that for a particular reason, because I'm here to enrol you. I want you to join the army. I want you to join the GAFCON army. And to do so, you need to say that you stand for those principles. You don't just join. You join and stand for those things. And my suspicion is that every person here tonight would certainly stand for the principles of the, uh, of the uh, GAFCON of the Jerusalem Statement. So I warn you that I'm going to ask you about that in an hour's time, uh, but I'm just warning you in advance, and that's what we are standing for. 
Now, uh, this is the moment, provided there are two microphones, I can see one. Uh, is there another one as well? We're going to hand it back and forth. Well, two men of our stature could manage that, I'm sure. Uh, but I'm going to interview the Archbishop and uh, I'm going to ask you to warmly greet our friend and the father of our movement. That is true. That is, that is correct. Now, my dear friend, if I may call you my dear friend, uh, my memory is that we met in the Hilton Hotel and you called us together there. Why did you do that? What led up to that moment, that meeting in December 2007 in the Hilton Hotel? Can you tell us about that? The leaders of the Global South met in China at the invitation of our brother John Chu, who was the secretary of the Global South, and I was the chairman. And Munir, the Archbishop of Egypt, was the treasurer. We worked together over the years, but the events leading up to that time indicated that the communion had shifted position from the biblical orthodox faith. And we in Africa, we had met and decided on the whole question of whether Lambeth Conference was worth it. And the answer was no. What was the point of going to meetings at great risks, great expenses, taking decisions which were never honored by the authorities? So in China, the three of us discussed this event and we decided not to stand in the way of those who want to go to Lambeth Conference but also to embrace and support those who choose not to go. For the first time in about 10 years, the Global South leadership broke ranks over this issue. So when I came back to my base in Abuja, in Nigeria, realizing that I had over 100 bishops in Nigeria, who wouldn't know where to do or where to go, I thought it would be wise to invite other brothers around the world to share our convictions. So we met in Nairobi, and the rest is history. What came off out of that meeting in Nairobi is GAFCON. And instead of going to Lambeth Conference in 2008, we met in Jerusalem and issued that declaration which our brother referred to a moment ago. Thank you very much. And my wife has never forgiven me, you know that, don't you? Because it was her chance to meet the Queen when she went to Lambeth. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm only joking. My wife was there at uh, GAFCON, yes. and uh, it was indeed one of the most remarkable events, one of the most remarkable moments of my life. Did you feel it the same way? Did you think that the GAFCON conference for you you could see the hand of God at work in the same way that I felt it. For so many reasons, I believe that GAFCON 208 was God's own creation. Given the circumstances, it was not possible at all for any human organization to put government together within the period that we did. We had less than five months to raise over three million dollars. No accommodation, no security, no money for food, and God provided all those things within five months. It takes seven, seven years to plan a conference. Two, when we 
rose from GAFCON 208. The meeting ended in credit. We got about a million dollars left or so? Yes. Or thereabout? Yes. Or thereabout? Lambeth Conference rose in deficit of over three million pounds. Yes. That's got some doing. But more than that, when the declaration was read, many of us were in tears. That within this same Anglican communion, there are leaders in this church who could still affirm the authority of scripture, who could still say that they believe in nothing else but this same gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he alone is the way, the truth, and the life. At a time when others were saying, Jesus is just one of the ways. At a time when others were saying, oh, it doesn't really matter what you believe. At a time when others were saying, it doesn't really matter, man could marry man, man could marry woman, that's who they are, that's what they are. And these people in Jerusalem declared, no, this is the way God has made it. That's the way we are going to follow. So for me, and for many of us who were there that day, it was something short of God's own direct intervention. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> I still can't think of it without tears, really. It was astonishing. Now, uh, dear brother, uh, just on the broader front now, has the uh, attitude of the Western churches, which so often have embraced heresy, really, does that make it more difficult to do evangelism and for stand for Christ in Africa. Do, do you find that, that, that what people do here impacts on what you do in Nigeria and elsewhere in Africa? Very much so. Um, when we met in Lambeth Palace at the invitation of um, Rowan Williams, the primates of the Global Anglican Communion, before the General Mission event, I invited Griswold, Frank Griswold, the American presiding bishop, outside of a coffee. And I said to him, Frank, what you people are doing in North America, you may think is good for you. But for the sake of the rest of us from around the world, kindly put it on hold. Don't do it. Because people will look at us as if we are worse than animals. How could we be doing exactly what the Bible says you not do? How do we defend it? It's indefensible. Please don't do it. And he said, unless Christ comes before the event of the general representation of the nation, they will go ahead. That was Frank Griswold to me. Now, I said that because we are in a global village. Whatever you do in England, in America, in Canada, resonates in other parts of the world. And our young people think that whatever you do must be the best for them too. And they copy blindly. They copy whatever you do here blindly without thinking. And you see it happening to today. And that aside, the Muslims in Nigeria, in other parts of Africa, they thought it was appalling. How could Christians be endorsing this kind of evil in this time and era? So we pleaded, and we are still pleading, that we uphold nothing but integrity of the word of God and never do anything that is not of the gospel. So to answer your question directly, yes, the agenda, the revisionist agenda, of the American church impacts negatively on mission outreach in Nigeria and other parts of Africa. Yes, thank you. And, uh, and you indeed have told them so, but it made no difference. A friend of mine was in Tanzania recently and uh, the taxi driver said, oh, he found out he was an Anglican. The taxi driver was Muslim. And the, he immediately said, oh, you're part of the church that, uh, that uh, ordains homosexuals. I wouldn't be a Christian. And uh, again and again, it just makes life very difficult at, at that level, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, one of the chief things that GAFCON did was to reach out the hand, and you were responsible for this in, in many ways, 
uh, to the uh, Christians of North America, United States and Canada, uh, to help them. Do you want to tell us about what happened uh, in helping the Christians in North America and what part you played in that? Well, when this whole thing became a real problem for us in the communion and all our pleas fell for on deaf ears and were not willing to change, and we knew that many of our Nigerian people who lived in America and Canada could no longer, in good conscience, worship in American churches. They used to call them um, Ekusa in those days. So we felt it was time for us to organize them um, into a separate church. But as we are planning to do that, we now realize that there are so many others, so many Americans and others, who felt the same way. And so they decided to join with us, and that was how Kena came about. And we invited all the other Anglicans who were no longer comfortable with what was going on in Ekusa to come along with us. Now we did that for a very simple reason. If we had not done that, many American Anglicans would have become members of other churches or of no church at all. They would have kept away coming from Christianity. So what we did was to provide a kind of safe harbor temporarily to accommodate all these people in the hope that with time, if there was change of heart on the part of Yakuza and church in Canada, then of course we would unite them with the churches. But instead of repenting and changing their ways, they simply advanced in this evil they are engaged in. Thank you very much. And so this, uh, the Church of the uh, uh, Anglican Church of North America came into existence, of which uh, so many here are part, and we thank God for that. But has the crisis passed? Uh, we, we did GAFCON in 2008. We had another great conference in Nairobi in 2013. I have to say again, uh, speaking personally, I just thought it was the Anglican communion having communion. It, it was wonderful. One of the things we've done, of course, we've called it the Global Anglican Future Conference. The Lambeth Conference is premised, I think, on the 19th century sailing ships or something like this. You know, you get the bishops only there and the bishops' wives, and they meet for three weeks, because after all, if you've come all that way, why wouldn't you meet for three weeks? Uh, but our Global Anglican Future Conference, the bishops, clergy, laity, young and old, we meet for a week, indeed the uh, youth is there, and uh, we meet for a week, and it was just like the Anglican communion having communion, it was astounding. But my question, sir, uh, is this, is there, do, we, do we need to keep going on? Uh, is GAFCON still needed? It did its great work, but is it still needed? GAFCON will continue to be relevant and needed for as long as the instruments of communion continue to fail to return to the Lord of the Bible. Um, if the authorities in Lambeth Palace and Canterbury, in Tech and Canada today will embrace Resolution 110, Lambeth Conference 1998, there will be no need for GAFCON. But as long as they continue to reject the supremacy of scripture for as long as it comes to preach what the Bible says we should not preach. Hallelujah to Gafcon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well now, I wonder, and you must wonder, whether there's any need to go on. We've heard, the, we've heard enough, and I hope that you're ready to enrol. In fact, if you want to, even as you're listening to me, you could take out this little piece of paper here, and you'll find on the... Now, I'm, I call this a brochure, but you guys call it something else. I don't know what you call it, a leaflet, perhaps. But uh, you'll see in this leaflet here that there's a, an enrolment form, and uh, near you there is a pen or pencil. I know that because we've made sure there is. 
And uh, if you get bored listening to me, or even if you don't, why don't you start filling it in? That would be a good thing to do. Uh, even if you don't intend to do any more, you can do that, and uh, no harm is done, and it makes it makes you look good because other people are watching you, and they say, "Oh, Joe's filling that in. Must be good." So there we are. Okay. Thank you so much, Archbishop. There's a telling moment in Isaiah, the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 5, verse 20, where the prophet speaks to his own people, the people of God, and he says, Woe to those who call evil good, and good evil, who put darkness for light, and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. The long light which has shone particularly in Europe and the West for these hundreds and hundreds of years has now faded. The dusk has occurred in the last decades and the night is now on us. And in Western country after Western country, we discover they who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Listen to my friend David McCarthy, who's a Anglican clergyman in Scotland. This is just one story amongst many, and here is what's happening in Scotland to the Episcopalians in Scotland. Here is what is happening there, and to tell you the truth, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, I couldn't have believed it. But now this is happening. Can we hear from David? Hello. My name is Dave McCarthy and I'm the rector of St Thomas's Church in Edinburgh in Scotland. Let me tell you a little bit about the history of St Thomas's. We were founded in the middle of the 19th century and we've been an Anglican evangelical presence in the city since then. We've got this wonderful long history of teaching and applying God's word. We've seen many people come to faith. We've seen some of them go on to uh, get ordained in churches of the Anglican communion. We remain committed to world mission through our mission partners. And we're also a church that's managed to do a little bit of church planting over the last 30 years. But we're now a congregation that's facing something of a crisis. Not only us facing that crisis, there are other congregations that are also concerned about the direction that our province is taking, and there are many leaders uh, around the province who are also concerned. The problem is this. In June 2016, the Scottish Episcopal Church General Synod embarked on a process to change the canon on marriage. The canon on marriage currently says that marriage is a lifelong union between a man and a woman. The plan is to remove that statement and that will allow people of the same sex to be married by those congregations and by those clergy who wish to do that. It will come up for its second reading at the General Synod in June 2017. Now we've done everything we possibly can uh, to influence this process. We've engaged in uh, the listening process as it's been called. We've uh, talked to our bishops. We've prayed with our bishops and we've uh, prayed with others and we've listened to others. But we now find ourselves in a situation where the doctrine of the church is about to change. And the question is, what do we do? Our concerns are manifold. We don't want to be separated from our brothers and sisters and the rest of the Anglican communion who are going to hold on to an orthodox understanding of marriage. We're concerned about the pastoral implications for people in our congregations who are same-sex attracted, who are living celibate lifestyles and who believe what God has said in his word about homosexual practice. What's going to happen to them? Uh, what are they going to hear uh, from the Scottish Episcopal Church in terms of support and encouragement to live that lifestyle? Uh, we're also concerned uh, about what will happen to our finances and how we will have to contribute to a church that is teaching these new things. So what are we to do? What are we to do in the face of this canonical change? 
Well, one thing that we have been enjoying is our relationship with GAFCON. I had the great privilege of attending the first GAFCON conference in Jerusalem in 2008. And it was a great joy to join with Anglican Christians from around the world as we focused again on the good news of Jesus, the transforming power that is available to us in and through him and through the work of the Holy Spirit. We were so grateful to be reminded of our connection with the wider Anglican communion. And so we've reached out to GAFCON as a way of maintaining a link with the communion. In October 2016, we invited Archbishop Foley Beach of the Anglican Church of North America to come and visit with us. And to our surprise, he accepted very quickly and came and visited with us, met with uh, various leaders uh, in Scotland and uh, visited several of our congregations while he was here. And it was a great joy to meet with him and to be encouraged by him and to pray with him. We were encouraged too by the knowledge that the GAFCON primates had the courage to support those in North America and Canada and the United States of America who faced a very similar situation to ourselves here in Scotland. And that has been a source of great hope for us as we look to the future. So we're grateful for our partnership with GAFCON. We hope that you'll pray for us and with us as we look to the Lord uh, for what our future is going to look like. But we're grateful that we remain connected with our Anglican brothers and sisters through the work, through the ministry of GAFCON. Why don't we pray for him? Dear God and loving Heavenly Father, we pray for David and the others who are standing fast for Christ in Scotland. Give them courage. Give them hope. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that by the ministry of GAFCON, we'll be able to take care of them, watch over them, and help them witness to the Lord Jesus when the darkness has come. And we commit them to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. That's GAFCON, praying for each other. Praying for each other, caring for each other. There was a church that, uh, that could stand it no more in New Zealand and, uh, and left. And uh, Charles Raven, who works with me, rang them up and said, what, what are you going to, are we going to, we're just on our own. So we've arranged for GAFCON to take care of that congregation while they're separated from the original church. That's GAFCON. That's you looking after people in other countries. What's happened? Well, the death of God has occurred. Remember, 19, you may not, but in 1967, Time magazine asked the question, is God dead? Very perceptive. Uh, the wallpaper changed. The assumption was up till then that uh, everyone believed in God in the Western world. Uh, but from then onwards, the assumption is that people don't really believe in God. Maybe not atheists, but God is no reality in their lives. The 1960s was the crucial decade of the 20th century and uh, the divide between a general belief and unbelief. That was the crucial decade. And that is when the dusk began which has now become the darkness. What did the church do? Well, basically it collapsed. Uh, mainstream church after mainstream church, uh, based on the Bible, if you read their original documents, uh, the Bible, the word of God, is the way in which God rules over his church. He speaks, we obey, we trust him. The Bible and, and the gospel, the great message of God, which transforms lives and brings forgiveness and renews us in the Holy Spirit and gives us hope for heaven, the Bible and the gospel were compromised. The rot began, I think, in theological education and the education in the seminaries of the ministers. I think the rot began there, wherein many of the seminaries, believe it or not, uh, the first year was spent trying to make the students doubt the Bible taking away their confidence in the scriptures. Oh, that's old stuff. You know, how could you, you're fundamentalist or other swear words like that. And so the church became compromised, particularly in its seminaries, which a bit invisible to lay people, what was going on. But you'd notice that 10 years later when your minister suddenly started to preach a little bit funny, no more in the Bible, not preaching the gospel anymore. And you'd notice that I remember sitting beside a man and a farmer, an Aussie farmer, six foot two, 
big, brown, strong. And he wept as he told me about his minister. He said, I've never heard anything like it. Where did he come from? He came from the seminary, which had compromised because the world around us has changed and we want to walk in step with the world around us. We've become so used to being the, the church of the world that when the world changed its opinions, we too began to change our opinions. And if the 1960s discovered sex, then of course it was sex about which we too changed. And so we can see in church after church, instead of the Bible ruling the church, human experience began to rule the church. I don't let's talk about the Bible. Let me tell you my story, people would say. And so human experience becomes the test of what's true and false. And there is a capitulation uh, with repercussions, as we've heard from the Archbishop, in the Global South. As even the Muslims say, what on earth are you doing belonging to a church like that when you don't believe that church, but you still get tired with it? I'll show you a photo. This is a photo from Scotland. Do you know what that is? It's a Muslim reading the Quran in a Scottish cathedral and a section that denied the divinity of Christ well, what do you expect? We've got to be kind to everyone. We've got to inclusive. We've got to include everyone. And here we have it. Imagine what harm that does to the cause of Christ in Tanzania. I was with some uh, African brothers the other day, and, uh, and I don't remember which country it was, but one of those East, Eastern African countries had recently 500 young Muslim men had been sent off overseas to the Middle East to train to be muftis to come back and to spread the gospel of Islam. And why wouldn't you spread the gospel of Islam? Because we're doing it for them. Let's turn that off, please. And so the death of God, the collapse of so much, not of all, the collapse of the church. What are the key issues? Well, the first issue is, of course, the authority of the Bible. but. The authority of the Bible in a particular way, it's to do with the clarity of the Bible. It's very interesting. Many people don't say, oh, the Bible's not true. Some are saying that, but many people are not saying, oh, not, they're not saying the Bible's not true. They're just saying the Bible's not clear. The Bible's not clear. It, it's not clear about sexual ethics. It's not clear that it's wrong to have sex outside marriage. It, it's not clear that homos the practice of homosexuality is wrong. It's just not clear. But dear brothers and sisters, Even the doctrine of the Trinity is not as clear as the sexual ethics of the Bible. And the doctrine of the Trinity is very clear. If there's anything that's clear in the Bible, and this is what people admit when they're being honest, if there's anything clear, the Bible says we are not to engage in fornication. And the Lord Jesus says this, not just the Bible as a whole, but the Lord Jesus says we're not to indulge in fornication, which includes, of course, sexual activity outside of marriage and between men and men and women and women. This is clearly condemned in the Bible. And more than that, it's not just condemned in the Bible. It is a salvation issue. The Bible says clearly that churches who engage in fornication are in danger of dissolution. It says clearly that a society that engages in this is experiencing the wrath of God, Romans 1. And it says that people who engage in this lose their salvation, 1 Corinthians 6. There are many things Christians disagree on, many, many, many things. We disagree on infant baptism and adult baptism, for example, but no one in their right mind thinks that a person who believes in only adult baptism is somehow losing their salvation. It's a serious disagreement, it's an important disagreement, but it's not a salvation disagreement. But the problem that we are now in is that churches around the globe, particularly in the West, are endorsing sin, which is deadly sin, and which will lead the proponents to condemnation. And that's why it's so important. Because the sin that is being endorsed is a salvation issue, 
and it in destroys the authority of the Word of God, not just the Bible, but the gospel which is enshrined in the Word of God. Because if you take the view that so many in the West have taken, you can't preach the gospel with honesty. How can you? Because how can you call for repentance when you don't think there's any need for repentance? And furthermore, and this came out very clearly in uh, David's um, uh, testimony there, what does it do to those Christians, men and women, same sex attracted, opposite sex attracted, who have lived holy lives and godly lives? I weep over my friends who have all their lives lived chastely because they were Christian men and women. And they're now being told they never had to make that sacrifice. They never had to live like that. What about supporting those who stand for Christ in their personal lives? What about them? Apparently, they get very little care from those who have a different point of view. The Bible is clear. The Bible is true. Furthermore, the teaching of the Bible is good. The tragedy of the capitulation of the church is that the message of the Bible is actually what is good for human beings. Our society is hurtling downhill to its own destruction. It is doing immense damage to individuals because of this lunacy of calling good evil and evil good. The teaching of the Bible is not only true, it's good and good for human beings. Can light dwell with darkness? That was the problem. For when a section of the church, and in the Bible, in Jude, for example, we see that this is predicted. When sections of the church embrace false teaching, and false teaching which puts at risk those who embrace it, how can we continue to have fellowship? All we can do is to say, and this is, this is our way of loving them, it's not as though we hate them, no. We love them. And the best way to love them is to say, we can't have fellowship with you. Please come back to the truth and embrace the gospel. Gafcon, which says we can't have fellowship with you, is not a hate filled movement it is a love filled movement calling for repentance because it loves the people who are straying from the bible and wants to see them come back that's our business to care for all and we do what must we do what must we all do this is not just a matter of leaders and you know people who fly in from overseas and wear funny vests and so forth and so on. It's not, not just a matter for us. It's a matter for everyone. And I believe that's why you're here tonight. What must we do? Well, first of all, we must ourselves love the truth. We must love the truth. The truth of God's word, the truth of the gospel, which is the central teaching of God's word. This is what we must hold beyond everything else as dear to our hearts. It is what the Lord Jesus wants us to do, who is our dear Lord and Saviour. This is what he wants. If you want to please him, love the truth, but love the truth of God's word, not human wisdom, not human experience, but the truth of God's word, which will make sense of human experience. Secondly, we should unite in the truth. Uh, division has been caused. Uh, Archbishop Akeola didn't cause the division. I didn't cause the division. Gafcon hasn't caused the division. The division has been caused by those who have rushed ahead without waiting, without listening, without listening to God or to the others, have rushed ahead and broken ranks over such an important matter and then look back and say, come on, come on, join us. No. And so, as we call upon them to repent, we must ourselves unite. But we must unite in the truth, not in falsehood. Unity is only as good as the truth on which you build it. Otherwise, it's just people bumping along together. We must unite, but we must unite in the truth.
I had a marvelous moment some years ago uh, at a conference in London, which was a GAFCON conference in 2012. I bumped into a uh, friend of mine who's a Nigerian bishop, archbishop. And I said to him, uh, how, do, how are you getting on? How do you like the conference? And he said to me, I've never forgotten it. He said, it's wonderful to be here. He said, now we know we're not alone. I was astounded because the Nigerian church is such a big church. The Nigerian church doesn't need anybody else. Hundred, more than 100, 120, 170 bishops, I've forgotten the number, but huge numbers of people, something like 20 million Anglicans. The Nigerian church is big. It is self-sufficient. It pays its own way. But my friend said, now we know we're not alone. And I tell you, our brothers and sisters in New Zealand are so glad that GAFCON, that you exist, that you can reach out to them through GAFCON. Now we know we're not alone. Our brothers and sisters in Australia who are facing something in the next five years perhaps of a similar thing, now we know we're not alone. Our brothers and sisters in England, in Ireland, in Wales, in Scotland, for whom this tempest is now upon them, now we know we're not alone. Our brothers and sisters in Uganda who have made such a remarkable stand for the gospel around their martyrs, now they know we know we're not alone. GAFCON is the means of fellowship which reassures, establishes, sustains and keeps us going. GAFCON is a great gift to us all which God has created so that we know we're not alone. We must love the truth, we must unite in the truth, we must contest for the truth. Standing, as Paul says, shoulder to shoulder for the truth of the gospel. Uh, yes, the darkness has come. The West is no longer Christian in any, in any way. Now it's all about spirituality, isn't it? I don't know about your part of the world, but it's, it's all about spirituality and so forth and so on. It'd be funny if it wasn't sad. But the early Christians, they, they were not a majority, they were a tiny minority. And it is said of the early Christians, listen, that they outlived, out thought and out loved the world. And so the gospel triumphed in nation after nation. They outlived, out loved and out thought the world. And that's what we're going to do. We mustn't despair, nothing to despair about. It's not as if the gospel hasn't been here before. <laughs> but the gospel your, gospel, your speaking of the gospel, your living of the gospel, your obeying the gospel is going to shine in the darkness as never before. And you are going to shine for Christ if you keep to the truth, unite in the truth, and live the truth, and contest for the truth. Well, what did Gafcon do? It spoke the truth and it paid the cost. It's very interesting that uh, money is fellowship. One of the ways in which the West is so plausible and clever is that the way in which we pay for things in the global south. It makes it very difficult, if you don't have much, then to receive money and to, uh, and to be, uh, with money comes influence. Money is fellowship. And I'm glad to report that a number of our friends in the Global South have simply said, no, we will not take the money. We will do without. And they have taken up the cross and followed Jesus in the same way as so many here in Canada have and in the rest of North America, where pensions have been lost, where status has gone, where church buildings have been sacrificed, where people have made a stand for Christ. And let me say to you, dear brothers and sisters in Canada, as I look on from Australia and I see what you have done, I am so grateful to you. I'm so thankful for your courage. I'm so grateful for what you've done. And I honour you for taking a stand for the Lord Jesus, which is a stand which has cost you. God be thanked. And that's what GAFCON helped you to do. 
What does GAFCON do now? Well, it unites people. We're creating networks of people around the world. You know, youth workers visit in this country who come through GAFCON. People visit across theological colleges. There's all sorts of motion goes on as we unite with each other and network with each other. And that's going to grow more and more. A whole group of church planters let in, met in London recently uh, to talk about how, to, and they come from several places, uh, to talk about how to do church planting. And some of them were from the Anglican Church of North America. Uh, GAFCON teaches. If you look at the website, we continue to teach the Word of God in a world of darkness. We're teaching the Word of God. Uh, GAFCON saves. <laughs> we save the saints of Scotland. We're ready, we're standing ready to save and to unite Anglicans and others who leave because they have no other choice. It meets. We're going to have GAFCON 3 shortly. GAFCON 3. We have had GAFCON 1 and GAFCON 2. We're about to have GAFCON 3 next year in Jerusalem again. And I'm hoping that some of you will be there. It'd be lovely if you're all there. We can't have everybody, but it'd be great if you were there and uh, meeting with us. And it would be an absolutely extraordinary time if you're able to be there. There's photos of uh, Nairobi on the bottom and, uh, and Jerusalem at the top. The first two meetings with the bishops there. Uh, and uh, they, were, they were wonderful times, both of them, absolutely extraordinary. And I, I believe that GAFCON 3, we're just getting Anglicans together uh, to have fellowship together. And the Canadian church has played its part in that. And uh, I believe you'll continue to do so. And yet it moves as well. Remember I said to you that the battle was lost originally in the theological colleges. Remember that? So one of the, the, the GAFCON leadership, the primates, have said to me that they want to make theological education the top priority for GAFCON. We've got a bit of a slogan. We want every Anglican bishop in the Anglican world to have access to excellent theological education. That'd be something. And so we, uh, I've just come from a meeting in Uganda where we uh, met and talked about the whole thing and, we, and people are giving towards it. Uh, and we are going to be doing all we can as GAFCON to make sure that the theological education all around the world, but particularly in those places where there are millions and millions of... Evangelism is tremendously successful and where theological education is needed. One of the great prime ministries of GAFCON is to make sure we don't make the mistake again of bad theological education, but Christ-honouring, Bible-believing, theological education as top priority in order that the churches, particularly of the Global South, are strengthened and equipped for the world in which we now find ourselves. So GAFCON, we have bishops training. We've had now one and we're going to have other training of bishops uh, so that bishops also can be equipped. Uh, but that's only the beginning of the many things we are doing and will be doing to make sure that the gospel is sustained in this dark world and that we can evangelise. <laughs> One of the things we had when we met in Nairobi was a whole session on how to re-evangelise the West. The Gafcon primates are nothing if not persuaded of the Great Commission. They want to make sure that the whole world, including Europe and Canada, is evangelised for Jesus. So they're not going to forget you. They want to help you to win this nation back to Christ which is where it should be. Forgive me for saying so, but I think that's true. Okay. Now, two further questions. What does GAFCON mean to me? And then what does GAFCON mean to you? Let me speak personally. I've laboured in and about and for GAFCON since its inception in 2007, when Archbishop Akeola simply told me that I was going to be the secretary. You don't think I said no, much as I wanted to. Many times I have sensed the Lord's hand, and I don't speak like this lightly, it's not the sort of language I use much, but many times I have sensed the Lord's hand of extraordinary blessing. By rights, no such movement should exist. The theological and cultural differences between us, the lack of resources, the inadequacy of my contribution as General Secretary, and I'm not being modest, has meant that it has faltered, it has almost failed from time to time. But a worldwide group of ordinary men and women have stood together and by faith 
refused to allow Gafgon to die or to fall apart. There have been moments, the final session in Jerusalem, the roll call of the nations in Nairobi, the wisdom and dignity of the primates at their meetings, I have been overwhelmed by the pain experienced by primates who look for leadership in the Western nations and England in particular and have been, they've been betrayed. Betrayed, that's what I would say. These and other moments have persuaded me that it is possible that we are seeing something which could be like another reformation. It's that significant. The brothers and sisters from all around the world have taught me so much in the last years. They've taught me to trust God. They've taught me the importance of speaking for Christ. They've taught me what courage means. They've offered me fellowship across some most amazing cultural and theological divides. And they've taught me the transformative power of the gospel. And so as I conclude, I ask, what does GAFCON mean for you? We are now walking in a new spiritual darkness. The churches are ill-prepared, but God is thoroughly prepared. He is not at a loss. There is nothing to fear, but we do need to work out new tactics for this new context. Without a doubt, we will walk by faith, but what does this mean? It must, it will mean, complete faithfulness to the word of God. It will require a fresh commitment to the clarity of the scriptures. GAFCON stands for clarity of scripture and the truth of scripture. At its heart, there will be a new experience of Christian fellowship based on the truth. We will discover that we are not alone, that there are 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Yes, it's that. It's an Elijah moment, brothers and sisters. Gafcon is a force which delivers fellowship and encourages courage. At its heart, there will be such a commitment to the gospel that we are prepared to dare the new in the cause of re-evangelising the West, to dare to do new things, to set up missionary societies. Gafcon has set up a missionary society in England, believe it or not. Not always popular, that move to create new structures, to abandon old ways. Gospel stands for Christian gospel mission. GAFCON stands for Christian gospel mission. Of course there are those who argue, oh, well, we can have two different views in the one denomination. Sincere people differ about the interpretation of the Bible. But let me offer a very serious warning. The cost of taking such a position and sticking with the original denomination when it goes off the rails is unacceptably high. It is to say that the Bible testimony is unclear or can be read in several ways, where in fact the biblical position is crystal clear. When the testimony of the Bible is rendered murky, the authority of the Bible is compromised. If worse comes to worse, it may be right to stay in a denomination under protest. It may be necessary to go but there always needs to be a clear confession of the faith and a willingness to pay the cost. The business of GAFCON, in short, is to deliver fellowship to orthodox believers who bear testimony in the midst of such confusion, to resource them. I'm going to start this paragraph again. The business of GAFCON is to deliver fellowship to you, orthodox believers, you who have borne testimony in the midst of such confusion, to resource you and to teach you the truth and to inspire you to keep preaching the gospel. GAFCON is here to do that so that you may know that you're not alone. Thank God that he's raised up GAFCON and I hope it has your keen support. Amen. Well, thank you, dear brothers and sisters, and uh, thank you for your fellowship in the gospel, which is such an encouragement to me, let me tell you. Um, now you're going to hear from me for another two or three minutes. Because how can you help? Oh, 
You can read that slide. You can pray. Notice that it comes first. Notice how important it is to pray for David McCarthy and his mates. How important it is to pray for the Christians in New Zealand. You know how to pray because you've been through it. Pray. Secondly, you can become a supporter. We're calling people supporters, uh, not members in case they think they can vote or something, but you become a supporter. <laughs> To do so, you are sent to the Jerusalem Declaration, and I've showed you what is in the Jerusalem Declaration because I want you to become a supporter tonight if you can. So I don't think there'll be much in the JD that you wouldn't agree to. And then become a partner. That is to say, someone who's able to give. Uh, I was uh, delighted uh, and pleased and, and uh, humbled to hear that uh, the bishop mentioned his intention to begin this immediately, become a partner. Uh, we need to keep the central operational wheels turning and we need to build up our funds for Jerusalem in 2018. I reckon we can probably get about, there's 2,000 people coming, we hope. We hope to get about 1,500 people there under their own steam. That's you, Canadians uh, and Australians. But there's about 500 people who will need significant help to get there. So we're going to need to raise money so that they can be there too. And we had 40 different countries there in Nairobi. I'm hoping we can have 80 different countries represented. We had a man from New Guinea. Ever heard of New Guinea? It's an island up north of Australia. 100,000 Anglicans in New Guinea. Mostly they're forgotten. Not by me. And we got our first New Guinean to the Nairobi conference. He's now a bishop. He, he, he keeps talking about Gafcon and how wonderful the experience was. And so we must make sure that we get New Guineans and Madagascans. There were four New Madagascans there. there I think there's about 400,000 Anglicans in Madagascar. Who cares for them? I do. We do. And they were there. They were there at Nairobi. I couldn't believe it. There was a Fijian there. Someone paid for the dean of the Fiji Cathedral to be there at Nairobi. I'm sorry, I'm just going on. But it was so wonderful to see these people there and to think that people in the West had generously given to help them to get there. You don't get to Nairobi without a bit of help from New Guinea, I can tell you that now. Quite a way. So, we need help. Here, uh, here it is, uh, just the budget, um, just so you know what it's about. We have operational costs, we think about 420,000 per annum uh, to keep the quite small, tight operational team going. We need a new general secretary, you've probably worked that out already. Uh, it's better not to be run by a geriatric. Um, uh, I am honorary and part-time. Uh, I support myself with, with some help, and, uh, but our next general secretary has to be full-time and paid for. And there's a lot more things that a general secretary, we really need a full-time general secretary who'll do the work. And so uh, for that and others, we need something like a $420,000 annually. And, we, uh, and we've, we, uh, we got mainly from Australia, as it turns out, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars as a start-up. So we've been able to employ our people but it was deliberately start up. They said, okay, after that you're on your own. So we're now getting to the point where we really need our supporters to do their bit. There's about 5,000 supporters, but I'm afraid most people have forgotten to give. So what we really need is something, oh, you know, if, if we could have even 2,500 people or 5,000 people giving what I give. I'm a pensioner for heaven's sake and I give. Christine and I decided we would give, so we give, I don't know, about $100 a year or something like that. If we have enough people giving, we'll be able to keep the thing going. And it won't be much, but it would be a great thing if we had that. And then we need people who are going to be very generous at another level, at the higher level as well. We, we need significant gifts. And then we need to build up to Jerusalem in 2018 to encourage people to come so that uh, and we're asking people to sponsor scholarships and so forth and so on. Uh, there's the long-term goal, two and a half thousand partners. Well, I say five thousand, why not? Globally giving fifteen dollars a month would do the trick. That'd be really good. So what am I asking you to do? I'm asking you, whoever you are, whatever you're doing, to take out the piece of paper. Um, it just encourages the person next to you if you do it. So if you wouldn't mind taking it out and having a look at the, um, 
You may not want to encourage the person next to you. Well, be careful where you sit in future. Okay. <laughs> And uh, you'll see there uh, that you can fill it in, give us your details. A little bit later on, we're going to come around and collect them. And then give some serious thought. Subscriber, yes, you can get the teaching that we give. That would be good. Uh, supporter, yes, if you're a supporter, that means you are sent to the JD. And I, I've taken you through that, and I think you would support it, most likely. And then would you become a partner? And here I'd like you to really think about this, perhaps a partner in both senses, to make a single donation, that would be hugely helpful. We need the money to keep going, frankly. And perhaps you'd make, like to join Christine and me in making a regular donation, uh, and you don't have to stop as low as we've suggested, you can go higher if you like. Uh, now I know there are many calls on, your, on, your, on, your, on money, and you ought to keep giving to everyone else as well. Um, but this is a cause, it's not so much the cause of the missionary work, it's not so much the cause even of the, of the, of the, of the compassion work. Uh, this is a cause to keep the gospel going. This is, this is a reformation type thing. And so uh, I'm urging you uh, to join the fellowship and to, and to give uh, significantly to the work that we're doing. Would you do that? Would you join the army? I'd be really so grateful. And really, it would be, in a sense, gratitude back because GAFCON has really saved you. And I'm hoping that you'll respond. Oh, by the way, uh, some, we, we, we're trying to get, we, get $50,000 in each location. I don't know if we can do that, but uh, we're trying to get that this year. But uh, someone's already given 5000 Isn't that good? So that's already happened. So, uh, so there we are. It's begun. Uh, is that all clear? Have I said everything I need to say, Bishop? He means stop. You're going on too long. That's what he means. Okay, we're going to have a few moments. I'll come and speak to you, ma'am. Uh, that's Pam there, isn't it? Uh, I'll come and speak to you. If you're not on the internet, still fill in your name and so forth, we'll get in touch with you. And, uh, and, uh, and please fill it in, and then a little bit later, we'll come around and collect all the things. And then we're going to conclude, and I believe there's going to be dessert afterwards. Isn't that good news? Thank you for your fellowship. Oh, hang on, the bishop is about to say something. Ken and Jay was just saying that some are asking, as it says in the blue book of leaflet, uh, if you would like to write a check tonight, you can write it to the Anakin Church in North America, and then, you're, and then for the memo line, GAFCON. Uh, and so, so Anglican Church in North America, not Anak, Anglican Church in North America, and then the Ga memo line, GAFCON. That's how you write the check. We're going to just take some time.